Hi there, my name is Chris Noring. I work for Microsoft. Welcome to this video. It's going to be a very exciting video. We're going to use an AI system, GitHub Copilot, and together we'll build a space game. So how are we going to do it? We're going to use natural language prompts mostly and a little bit of tweaking using normal programming. So come with me into this video. In today's video, we're looking to build a space game. So what you're looking at here right on the screen is a space fighter fighting some enemy fighters and you use a laser to shoot them down. And you can also see how you have a number of ships in the bottom right of this image and how there's a score that increases every time you defeat an enemy fighter. We will try to build something like it, so stay tuned. And uh, yeah, let's dive into Visual Studio Code and you can see how we can use an AI assistant like GitHub Copilot to help us build this awesome looking game. So now we're inside of Visual Studio Code and you can see here how we've opened up GitHub Copilot chat menu and you can see this icon right here. This is how you activate it. What I've started doing is to type a prompt, a natural language text prompt to describe to Copilot what I'm about to build. And this food should be full of context. So here I'm saying build a space game that contains a ship you control. It should be uh, a green, not screen. Let's edit that to rectangle. And three enemy fighters uh, placed at the top of the screen. The screen is 800 by 600 pixels and uses a canvas element because canvas elements are what we used within HTML and web development. So let's provide this instruction to GitHub Copilot to see what kind of code that it spits out. It should also be aware of the context being a .js file and this, therefore, it should infer that we are dealing with JavaScript. So we're sending this instruction and back comes an implementation that uses a canvas element, but also the notion of a game JS. Now you can see how it separates between the two. It says, here's your HTML code and here's your JavaScript code. And we get this initial implementation. And it's still kind of generating code at this point, but let's let's actually try to scroll a little bit or, or maybe we should just wait. Now it's done. Let's scroll to the top and we can see that it, and if we expand this a little bit, we see that there's HTML markup code that says, here's your canvas element, here's your script tag so that you can include the uh, JavaScript uh, file as a reference. And it's also, here in the JavaScript section of things, it's creating the canvas, it's give, getting us something called a context, and it's creating a player for us with various attributes. It creates a set of enemies and a draw rectangle function and a game loop, and it starts the game loop. So now we are intrigued, of course, to see what this first code scaffold is actually giving us and see how we can keep working with that, because that's the key word here. We're going to keep on working with our AI assistant. It has given us our first game. So let's see what happens here. So now we have the uh, option to select copy or just insert the code at the cursor. Insertion is good when we have existing code and copy is good if you, you don't want to insert the code, but copy it and paste it in some other place. So we're going to place ourselves here and choose to insert the code and we can see how all of that code landed here. Now there's a few things that we need to consider. One is the game canvas element. So what we'll also do is to go into here and just make sure that we have a file here that's able to contain HTML. Okay, great. It's blank. So we go back to our chat. And at this point, we are going to do some insertion. So now we're going to use the insertion again. And you see that how it points to game.js. The file is not named that way. So we want to make sure that the naming is correct. And it refers to it as a game canvas. All right. So this one is called new game. So we might just want to do new game at this point. So it points correctly. To test a game written in for web development, you need some kind of HTTP server to run it. But the good news here, here is that we can use something called HTTP server. Like so. So this will run a web server for us and it will run itself on port 5000. So now we're just going to kick off the web server to make sure that we can visualize this game. So that's great. Let's hide this and just and now if we look at the code and the visualization of our game side by side, you can see now how the green is our uh, 
fighter that we control and the three red ones are the enemies. And let's just inspect this code from top to bottom. We see that the player has a notion of a starting position. It has a width and height and the color green. And the enemies is the color red. And we have a draw rectangle function that fills our uh, graphical object that we're about to draw. And then it creates the actual rect. So looking at the game loop here, we see how it does a clear rect command, which is kind of cleaning the screen. And then it calls draw rect on the player. And then it loops through all of the different enemies to paint them out on the screen. And we see here how the game loop function that we're currently in is passed to something called request animation frame. And this is something that helps establish a game loop, game loop to make sure that things are being drawn smoothly to the screen. Now, at this point, we actually have something, but we can't really move our player, right? So what we want to do at this point is to instruct Copilot how to move things. Now, so we've typed another prompt here in the bottom left in our chat client towards uh, GitHub Copilot. We've said make the player move. It should use the keys WASD to do so. This is an old key combination in, in games that I've played in the past, where a W is to move forward, S is moving backwards, A is moving to the left, and D is moving to the right. So let's give this let's give this instruction. And then it says, sure, we can add event listeners for key down and key up positions. Event listeners are uh, uh, things that react to events that happens and you can connect a function to these events to build your game. So now it's kind of updating part of the code, but it's giving us the entire code base back. So at this point, we can just see how it's able to give us a lot of things. And let's wait till it has finished rendering. Great, so now it's just summarizing all the different additions in the code. Looking at it here uh, from top to bottom, we can see that we have this add event listener function that's new and it kind of changes the place position. And we see how there's another event listener for key up, which is also able to help us. And then it kind of calls the game loop and you see how the place position is being updated as a result. And yeah, that's pretty much it. So. What we're going to do at this point is just taking all of this code and we're going to take this suggestion and just insert it. So now we can see how our code here is being updated. Now, one thing we want to do with JavaScript because it caches the file by default is that we need to go in and refresh the resource because right now the JavaScript file is being updated, but the web browser doesn't know about it. So now at this point, Come in here, let's hide this and see if we can actually move our player and we can. You see how smooth that is? We can move it forward, backward, but there seems to be a bottom limit here of which we can't move it, which is of course our screen or screen size. So uh, we want some kind of progression. So question is what we should do next. A great way to see what to do next is to say, how can I detect collisions between the player ship and the enemy fighters in the space game. So now I can actually type this myself or I can just tell uh, Copilot to run it for me. So at this point I'm running this and say you can detect collisions by checking if any of the corners of the player's rectangle are inside of the enemy's rectangles. And that's that's true, right? Because if you got an enemy represented as a rectangle and you being represented as a rectangle, if there's any kind of overlap between these two rectangles, you have a collision. So now it's kind of drawing up all the different code here and it's showing you what you need to do. So for one, it's showing you that you probably need some kind of is colliding function. Okay, fair enough. So we need to add that, but it also looks like it has done some uh, alterations to the game loop function. And it looks like we could actually take the game loop function as is. Those seems to be the changes. Just make sure we don't lose any information there. And like before, let's see if we can just do a hard reset of the code like we usually do in a browser just to say empty cache and reset. 
And now is the question in as part of our code base now that we have an is collision thing, do we have any kind of action that should happen if we collide? So this one is just saying is colliding. So let's see in our code where it's actually saying, well, if it's colliding, then it should write something to the console. So what we want to do is in our game now, move around our player with these uh, keys and make sure that there is a collection to see if we get some kind of print in our logs. So now there should be a collection, right? So we can just check, view the source, and now we can see how it actually uh, collided over 38 times because this, this is running the collision uh, detection quite often, right? So that's why we have 38 different uh, collisions, but collision seems to be working. So that's really good news. What we want to do though, is if you think about it from a game aspect is to say, well, if the player and the enemy fighter is colliding, there should probably be some kind of explosion, right? Because if two ships collide in, in space, that's not a good result for either of them. So actually ask now in prompts, destroy hero, sorry, destroy player and enemy fighter if they collide. So far, it's been going really well. All the prompts have um, produced working code for us, but there might be instances where it doesn't work and you still need your know-how as a, a developer to know how to fix it. But for now, it seems to be responding. See if we can make this a bit bigger. And now it's done. So let's just see what it responded with. It says to destroy the player and the enemy fighter when they collide, you can remove the enemy from the enemy's array and stop the game loop when a collision is detected. Here's how you can modify your game loop. So it looks like it is actually calling enemy splice here to remove the enemy from the list. That's great. And that seems to be the only change. I did ask it in the instruction to destroy the player as well. So I'm not, I'm not really saying that, am I? So that's an oversight now from our AI assistant that is, does nothing about the player. However, though, it is stopping the game loop. So maybe this is the way that it actually implemented it. Because if you're stopping the game loop, that means that no other future updates such as you moving the player will actually be registered. So this is actually a, a good implementation of doing that. But what we're going to do is to copy this function and go in here because it's updated the game loop, right? And see if we can just replace it as is and see what happens. So now it says, uh, as I said before, it's trying to remove the enemy from the enemy's list if collision, uh, collision happened. And return here means that we will actually jump out of uh, the game loop because we are returning from this function. So let's see if this works as intended. So now we have updated the file. Let's see what happens if we are actually trying to attempt some kind of collision. Okay, we see that we are still alive, but that means that the uh, there is no code that actually works. That was my mistake. But what we do can see is that the enemy fighter is disappearing as we are colliding with it. We seem to have a bug though, because you see the first uh, element is actually uh, being removed. And as we remove the second element, it's removing the wrong element. So there seems to be some kind of logic mistake here. So if I do this, the right one disappears. If I do that, it stops here. Okay, so we've seemed to fix the bug because the bug was introduced by this return uh, clause. And this is why um, by commenting it out, the game started behaving as normal. I'll demo that to you. So now we are controlling our ship. You see how I'm colliding with the first fighter, the second fighter and the third fighter. Now this might not be the behavior that you want because then, you know, your hero ship should be, you know, fragile. You shouldn't just be able to crash out your enemies. You should be shooting them down. Right, so we need to change that logic. So somehow we need to tell the player that the game is over. There's a game over if the player and the enemy actually collides. So let's see how we can do that. So now we are giving an instruction to our AI assistant to say if a player and an enemy collide, oh, it helps if I spell correctly, display a game over message and reset the game. So let's see what it does with that information. And this is really declarative, as you can see. We are building our game with messages alone even though we might need to tweak it a little bit, as you saw when it introduces a bug. 
to display a game over message and reset the game with the enemy collide, you can create a function, okay? You can also use a fill text method to display a game over. So it's rendering a lot of text here and it makes it hard to read, so just give it a second. Okay, it did a few things for us. Uh, if we just read it from top to bottom, we see that the reset game is replacing the player in its starting position and the enemies in their starting position. And we look through the game loop function to see what's going on. And let's make this a little bit bigger. And if we see that if there's a collision between player and enemy, we see that there's a fill style white, a font being set and a fill text where it's trying to display the text and that there's a timeout after which timeout three seconds in this case, it's going to call reset game. So that all sounds good. So what we're going to do with this information and is to first copy this piece of functionality that didn't exist before. So now we have a reset game function. And if we look at the game loop, you can see that everything that happens within is collision. Let's go back and get grab that code there. So now we're setting some kind of pen color to white, uh, font size to 48 pixels, and we are printing out a text that says game over in the middle of the screen, the way it looks. And then three seconds later, it's kind of resetting all the positions and all the enemies are being re-added. So let's see if that works. We are moving our player and it collides and it says game over. And at this point, you see how everyone now, after three seconds, are back in their positions. We can probably improve this experience a little bit, but we can clearly see that it displays game over where, when it should. And now we want to, honestly, we want to add lasers because how cool is a space game if it doesn't have lasers? So now we've authored an yet another prompt. And now we're saying when a player presses space, it should shoot a laser from the top of the ship at high speed. If laser collides with the enemy ship, then laser and enemy should be destroyed. Laser should also have a cooldown, so it can only be fired every 0.5 seconds. Now that's quite a lot of instructions, so let's see how Copilot is able to manage. It's definitely thinking about it, and it's saying, yes, Chris, I need to add a few things here. I need to add an array to hold lasers. I need an event listener to listen to key presses, fair enough a cooldown mechanism to prevent firing too quickly, and a collision detection for lasers and enemy. And that's great. It's giving me a list back that definitely seems like it's caring about all the things I care about. So now if we look at this rendering, we can see early on that it's creating all the needed variables for the lasers and the cooldown and the fire delay, uh, the event listener, and any alterations into the game loop that's needed. So I think it's still working on it. So you see how easily when you add these game elements that your code suddenly becomes quite complex. But uh, the good part is that for now, Copilot is able to handle most of it. And now it's just summarizing what it did. So there, there we go. Now we have the full code and you can also see how the code coloring is in place. So uh, we just need to see little by little what it's adding to our code. So we kind of scroll to the very top and see how we can add things. So for one, it's adding these variables and we can just add those. You can add those anywhere, but needs to be at the top. And it's adding a key down function to see if I'm actually pressing space. Fair enough. Maybe below all the enemies and the players. So now what it's doing is that it's adding a laser to the laser array uh, at the very position where the player is at, and it is the color yellow. We can always customize that, right? And let's check the game loop, where it looks like it's updating and drawing the lasers. Seems like we're going to need that. That sounds fair. And where do we need to add it? Right after it clears the screen. Fair enough. Let's add it right here. Now we have a way to draw our lasers and drawing the player uh -huh, uh -huh. and we see that within this collision loop because this uh, collision detection needs to happen when we are trying to draw out the enemies right because as we're drawing the enemies we need to check if we actually need to reduce the number of enemies so now we're looking for a loop where we're drawing enemies and we check that we already have this first code that says is colliding and right below it we should be adding a detection to see if indeed the current enemy is colliding with a laser. If that happens, then remove said enemy, remove the laser. 
And I think that's pretty much it. Let's see if this actually works. It would be fantastic. And let's try to move around our ship. Everything still works. That's always something you want to check for regressions to make sure that your ship or anything else doesn't break. So let's hit the space. Whoa, and that was a laser. Whoa, and that fired as well. Boom. And we've won the day, right? We've beaten all the enemy ships. So now, of course, we need to make this into a real looking game, which means it should work like a game does, which means I should be awarded points when I actually shoot down an enemy fighter. So I'm giving it this prompt where I say show score at the top right of the screen. It should add 50 points every time a laser destroys an enemy. So that hopefully is enough context for Copilot to understand what I'm after. And of course, it responds back and say, yes, Chris, you need some kind of score variable and we need to call fill text to display any kind of text. And then it's also figuring out that first off, I need some kind of variable to track score. So I can add that to the very top. There you go. And it looks like display score is a new thing here. So we definitely want to copy that. And let's just see where it ended up in the loop. So let's find the game loop function. So it seems to happen right after here, where we clear the screen. So now it's kind of showing the score. Fair enough. Check for collisions with lasers. And now it's actually adding to the score within the collision between the enemy and the laser, which means that we need to scroll down to the very bottom where it's actually removing just before the break close, as you can see. So you just need to visually match what's going on here. Great. So now we're adding a score. So let's see if this works. Let's make this screen a little bigger so that we can actually see the score. We can always shift the screen back and forth like this. So now we're looking at three enemies. We're looking at our player and the score at the very top, which is zero, which is to be expected because we just started the game. So now we move around the fighter and we're firing. Boom. We see that we get 50 score and 100 score. And we missed, of course. Bam. It's a sitting target. Why should we miss, right? So now we get a score of 150 because we shot down three enemy fighters. But what we want to do at this point is probably look at, see if we can detect the end condition of the game. And the end condition is either when we pick up um, all the power-ups or maybe we shoot down all the enemies or some other thing that makes us finish the game or the level. So let's see if we can do that next. Okay, so we have a game. We're able to move this fighter around. We're even able to fire laser at an enemy fighter and take it out. That's great, but we don't have an end condition. This game just ends with no fighters left to fight. So one of the first things we want to add is, of course, an end condition. We want to be able to be shown some kind of congratulations text as you win. So how can we do that? Well, we can uh, type a prompt that says that the user is, uh, I want an end condition. So add end condition when there are no more enemies. Should show text that says you won. If text is clicked, then game should reset. So let's see if Copilot is able to cater to all those requirements. So hopefully now we will have some kind of end condition to our game and we feel that there's a purpose of us destroying the enemy fighters. And now it just tells us how to do it. So it says to implement this, you can add a check in your game loop to see if the enemy's array is empty. Because remember, enemies are being removed from this array. And here it just shows us how to implement the code. And of course, it's going to repeat some of the code that we've already seen. So what we need to do is to kind of localize within our own code where this code is, is at. So let's see where we're at. This looks like it just adds an if on the same level as the collision with the laser. Okay, fair enough. So let's copy that piece. So now it's saying if enemies length equals zero, display you one message. And this is just showing me this. And this one says, if I click 
then call reset game once true, which means that the event handler will disappear after this is done. So let's see if this actually works. Okay, so now we have our fighter. Let's take out those fighters. Eh, we missed. Now we hit it and it says U1. If I click U1, does something happen? Nothing actually happened, so that doesn't seem to be working. Why is that? Okay, so uh, we're in here. We have our event listener. We switch this out a little bit. Whoop. And we call reset game and then we're just calling the animation frame just to make sure that everything is repainted after reset. So we have a fresh board with our enemies and our player. And this event call handler, make sure that we only listen to this click once. That's great. And then we return the method because there's nothing here left to do. Now all of this is great and we have a working game that we can play as many times as we want. Isn't that fantastic? But it's just squares, right? And we want to see something else. We want to see graphics, am I right? So let's actually see if we got any game assets that we could use. We have an enemy PNG that looks good, a laser PNG, and a player PNG. Doesn't that look amazing? Well, the next step is to understand how to load image assets and display those in the screen instead of the squares. So let's see if we can actually do that with a prompt. So now we have crafted this prompt where we say from the asset folder, load images, hero PNG, enemy PNG, and laser PNG asynchronously, which means uh, that things will take time to load. It's one second or maybe several seconds. And now we're instructing it to use that instead of the rectangles. This is a very high level instruction. So let's see if it's able to cope. So now Copilot is thinking about it. To load images and draw them instead of rectangles, you can use an image like this. Okay, fair enough. And then we need to load each of these images on the onload method. Okay, so now it's chaining together player image, enemy image, and laser image. And then it makes sure that all the images are being loaded. And uh huh, uh huh. Right. And then it says draw image as a new method. Okay, fair enough. And now it's saying to use draw image on all the things instead. So this could actually work. So let's see if we can integrate this code as part of our program. Okay, so moment of truth, right? We are now looking at uh, our player fighter and we can, we can move it around. We got enemy fighters and we can fire with our laser. And we're able to take down the enemy fighter and all our logic seems to be working as it should. Isn't that fantastic, right? A great looking space game. Now, there are tons of ways that you could be improving the space game, but we took you from rectangles to actual game, game assets. And this is something that you want to maintain. Wasn't that exciting? We were able to build our space game. We were mostly using natural language prompts, your own language. We were using a little bit of programming just to tweak things. But all in all, in a very short amount of time, you have a working space game. You have something that you can keep working on, keep adding features to, and a lot of other amazing graphics that you can dream up.